All right, so this is a very good site uh, for Dolly's paintings. Uh, Dollypaintings.com it is, it contains all his masterpieces. So um, let's just look at some of them. Um, his, you know, his style evolved, what he did it evolved through the decades. And um, this is one that he was, uh, <laughs> was very influenced mm -hmm. by Picasso in the mm -hmm. uh, early years. He loved Picasso. And so you can see it's a Cubist uh, crucifixion, I suppose it is. Uh, but it, it also is, shows Dolly's uh, signature unique perspectives, often from below. I mean, you'll see his later crucifixion of Christ similar. It's like looking, um, and he was a master for sure. I mean, so, but this was very, very Cubist. Um, but I don't think it's intentionally, um, it's um, his, uh, Anna Maria, uh, who I forget that who that was. Um, so Dolly would give you these really dramatic, unusual uh, viewpoints, perspectives. Uh, there's another one, the Ascension of Christ. 58. Um, <clears throat> we could see this on our phones mm -hmm. and turn the volume up. There it is. Um, so it's like he's having a, a vision. The Christ is appearing the bottom. He's looking. He got criticized for painting the bottom of Jesus' feet. But uh, uh, Caravaggio did the same thing. Um, not uh, with the these... Uh, <clears throat> The ascension of Christ. Yeah. Keep reading to me because I can't hear it. Okay, so we got a, let's see, who's yes. uh, Dom and, and um, Herb, can you mute your mics? Because when you talk, they can hear you. Okay, thanks. Okay. So, great. Do what? Great mute because he... That's good. Uh, <clears throat> the feet of the Christ points out at the viewer drawing the eye inwards along the body to the center. It's an atom. It's a, uh, uh, he said it came from a cosmic dream that he had in 1950. You can also see his mastery. Uh, like I said, he's recognized his painting skills as having equal mastery to great masters, Valasquez, Vermeer, and um, so, you know, he, he took that and did these very contemporary modern paintings, surreal paintings. Uh, you can see the influence on the Hieronymus both. Uh. Let's see here, so many. It's not the one I want. Some of these links are wrong. I'll click on the picture. That's it. My wife, nude, contemplating her own flesh, becoming stairs, three vertebrae, column, sky, and architecture. All right. So she, uh, <clears throat> this was 1950, so the atomic bomb and disintegration, um, et cetera, had a profound impact on him. So it's almost like you're looking through historical periods. This is very Renaissance, you know, done with the skill of a Renaissance painter. And then the whole um, disintegration of a form, looks like a rocket ship. Um,
1939. Um, this was the first of nine ballets designed by Dali for New York. Uh, it was a set design. Bacchanale was a was a ballet, and I think this was the main, probably one of the set pieces. So what is, what is the Lita and the Swan reminds me of? <clears throat> So, you know, I uh, hit with this uh, surreal image, um, and yet it's done with the finesse of a Renaissance master. And often his uh, paintings, what's psychological? Um, meaning it's like there's this openness in the swan and it looks like it pulls you into some kind of path through some kind of dream and a dream-like quality or a nightmare, um, you know, going down this path into some bizarre surreal landscape and these figures that are like ghosts or spirits, you know, <clears throat> right relates to the, to the play, this design, this dark shot, ominous shadow, you know, the skeleton of a boat or yeah, it's like a boat or maybe a skeleton of a whale. <clears throat> and these, yeah, these, these, you often see these forlorn landscapes like they're dreamlike, um, uh, kind of suggesting infinity, going off to nowhere. You could be in the Sahara Desert, you know, just the emptiness, um, stretching and stretching forever. <clears throat> Oops, I went, went too far. Come on. <clears throat> Not doing a lot. Might have too much open. There we go. All right, let's look at a couple more. Face of war, World War II, planetists in, in World War II. He was in California, the Spanish Civil War. So, um, <clears throat> like Picasso with Guernica. Then he would get more traditional, but again, his unique perspective. He's either looking, you know, you're looking from below up at the feet of Christ, or you're floating in the air above the crucified Christ. Um, you know, getting that foreshortening right is really difficult to, you know, to imagine yourself looking down like that to get it looking accurate. But this is the most popular of his religious works, it says here. So in 1950, I had a cosmic dream in which I saw this image in color, in which in my dream represented the nucleus of the atom. The nucleus later took on a metaphysical sense. I considered the very unity of the universe, the Christ. And then I saw the Christ drawn by St. John of the Cross. I worked out geometrically a triangle and a circle which aesthetically summarized all my previous experiments, and I have inscribed, inscribed my Christ into this triangle. Uh, so 
No, it's a powerful image. A totally original, unique way of doing the crucifixion. I'll look at one more. And here's another uh, oh, Last Supper. Now you can see this crucifixion. You may have seen it before. You never see Christ's face. He did more than one melting watch. He did several of them. This was one in 54 later, close up. And it's, you know, influenced by quantum physics take on time, how it's elastic, not as set as we think. We're just experiencing time a certain way from our um, space-time perspective. It's a famous painting, it's Last Supper, 1955. I see what there's a figure of Christ. Again, you don't see his face. And he's transparent. You can see right through part of his body, see part of his chest. Same here. Or this is maybe God the Father, I'm not sure. All right, one more. Let's see here. Mm -hmm. Rock and roll, that's a nasty one, I saw this one. <laughs> All right, so I just want to show you some of these. Um, Again, influenced by unconscious dreams, sexuality, very, very connected to the tradition of um, Western painting. He's often referencing paintings or doing his own version, like Picasso of famous paintings. He loved Velasquez. I think he was Velasquez. Um, and um, <clears throat> a unique combination of traditional, conservative, and totally out there avant-garde in his painting and his lifestyle and his personality. Um, so what a really unique character. But you, he, he was a, I just admire his painting skills, his imagination and his incredible painting technique skills, his mastery of old, the old master techniques. Um, so. Any comments on Dolly before we leave him? Anything? Anybody want to say? You have to unmute your mic if you if you say something. <clears throat> but it, that picture you showed of the of the Last Supper, yeah. who was that figure? If that 
you know, wasn't that supposed to be Christ, the yeah. one that? Yeah. yeah. Okay, but, so he did show the face. He did there, yeah. I'm sorry. But yeah, yeah. The face of the um, is that Christ behind, where it's just cut off at the neck, or is it God the Father? I'm not sure. Yeah. 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 Joe. Yes. You, you, in Dolly's very early work, he was more uh, a more of a realistic painter, and he started when he first started out. He wasn't doing this kind of thing, and then in addition, when he did do this, he he painted many pictures which had double meanings. If you looked at them long enough, yeah, you could see two different yeah, like this one, two different pictures in the same painting. Yeah, I like yeah. this. Uh, so it's uh, there's a face on the side, but it's a hut. And it's a variety of things, it's like a gestalt image. But he didn't stay realistic for very long. I mean, um, no, he I, didn't. No, he didn't. But he, but he, but art, he had the talent to do it. Yeah, art school. I mean, when he was in art school, he. But as soon as he got out of art school, and he went to um, um, Barcelona and Madrid, he was connected with the surrealists pretty quickly. So. He, there's not very many uh, realistic paintings by him. Occasionally, actually, over the years, he did a couple that were harking back to that period. But he, like Picasso, he could master realism. You know, it was, it was he already mastered that, so he didn't have to spend very long there. Okay. Isn't uh, there a, isn't there a museum of Salvador Dali in Florida? Yes, in St. Yeah. There's two main Dali museums. The one in uh, St. Petersburg. Wow. It's a beautiful museum. And um, there's one at Dolly's home that he built. And um, it's worth going on YouTube. But we did some of that last week, um, getting a tour of the Dolly. You can do online tours of both. But the, the one at, of his home that he created himself was pretty amazing. Wow. Yeah. Uh, he, he knew this was going to be his gift to the world and it's all the rooms are uh, the whole thing is a work of art it's, it's really incredible yeah. all right so well you know Picasso it's amazing this um Picasso and Dali uh Matisse were the three three giants you know of the 20th century but two two Spaniards two greats you know um and then uh, let's see. All right, so I want to introduce you. Has anyone ever heard here heard of spiral dynamics? Anyone? I'm on Wikipedia. Anybody ever hear of spiral dynamics? No. That's a no. <laughs> All right. Then I'm. It's uh, let me. Pop this up first, the, the Wikipedia page. All right, spiral dynamics. It's really worth knowing about. Um, there's many models of human development and ego development out there. The American philosopher Ken Wilber published a book examining a hundred different models of um, human and social development, the stages of development. You know, and so why I like this, Mayor Baba, you know, in um, his books, God Speaks and other places, he, he um, gives a, a model for um, how the soul, the journey of the soul. And, but in the gross sphere, he didn't really delineate the, the stages that humans go through in their gross conscious um, stage of development. He expressed, he explained some how the, the levels of spiritual advancement, um, the subtle world in the first, second, third, fourth planes, and a little more um, and a little more detail you get in, ba in Bao's book, the nothing and the everything, and also the mental sphere, the two, the fifth and sixth planes. But the gross sphere, uh, uh, at least I haven't seen any uh, um, of Baba kind of um, <clears throat> breaking it down to stages. It's just, uh, it's just one uh, global state of, con of consciousness, you know. Um, but uh, so, like I said, there's many models that do look at that. And I think from a, uh, this is my favorite. And it's been around for a while. 
uh, spir spiral dynamics. I'm gonna, there's some color chart down here. And there was a, a psychologist um, named Claire Graves who first developed it and um, a professor at, in New York. And then it was this man, Don Beck from um, university at the university in Texas who worked with Graves. And Don Beck wrote a book in Popolize and, and developed the model even more. So Don Beck and, and also uh, Christopher Cullen, they co-authored the, the original book on spiral dynamics. So um, the, the model is that all humans and also societies, uh, nations, go through predictable stages of development, okay? And, and so how I, I, what I've been doing is trying to relate this to art and art appreciation because the art that comes that individ, individuals make will depend on their stage of development. And the art that a society values or considers worthwhile is also dependent on um, that stage of development of a society. Okay, so, um, so there's different uh, lines of development uh, uh, that go through that. Uh, there's a, a cognitive development, emotional development, spiritual development, aesthetic appreciation development, and they go through these, these stages, all right? Uh, so I went at this information here, it's just a barely scratching the surface of, um, of spiral dynamics. Uh, and, I'll explain a little more in a second, but let me just go through the basics of it, okay? Um, ah. Okay, so they're color coded just for um, ease of remembrance. And, and what these are, are, are basic, they call them memes, but they're basic value systems that undermine uh, what individuals and societies consider most important, and what their beliefs are, what their, what their what their basic yeah, I was very interested in is over, you know. Uh, Rosie, can you meet your mic? Meet Rosie. Yeah. Rosie, can you meet yeah. me? Unless were you talking to me or make I couldn't tell you. I couldn't oh. tell. Hey. Was that a comment to the class? I don't want to cut you off if, you, if it was. Okay. Um, so the first stage they call beige, they give the color beige. And it's really like, imagine the uh, humans' first early incarnations. They're just, they're still um, cavemen. You know, they're earliest people, uh, earliest humans. And um, these are some of the, some of the uh, characteristics of these earliest humans. Automatic, autistic, reflexive centers. Um, their drives are just around um, satisfaction of really primitive drives. Um, driven by deep brain programs, driven by instincts, genetics. So a lot of animal in, instinctual behavior still there, but they're humans, okay? Uh, little awareness of the self as a distinct being, undifferentiated. You know, you can imagine living off the land if they, we did a lot from Africa, you know, um, and minimal impact or control over environment. So uh, art, art as art hasn't really emerged yet in this early stage of beige. Uh, unless they're making tools, uh, probably they're making tools. So the so if if the tools have some kind of um, um, artistic uh, value, possibly, but they're functional. Now I'm thinking towards the and each of these stages um, aren't there. You can also break down and say early, middle, late. Okay, so there's an evolution through the stages, and it could be over thousands of lifetimes. You know, or maybe. Mayor Baba said 8,400,000 lifetimes. That's just through the growth sphere. So that could be a million lifetimes in each one. So there's an evolution of consciousness that happens. So you can roughly break it down into early, middle, and late. And I think towards the late, art starts to emerge. And I think the cave paintings, Lusso and other places, and some of the rock drawings you see around the world uh, from uh, that go way back would probably be the kind of art that emerged towards the end of this beige uh, state of consciousness in humans. And they're not just like those cave paintings. I don't, they're not just doing that like, oh, let's put a pretty painting of, of bison uh, so we can decorate our cave. Um, I think it served a purpose. And I think they discovered that, and, and this becomes clear in, in the next stage, that uh, by 
drawing the bison or the animals that they were hunting, the wolves, that, which they did on the caves, it actually uh, was a way of connecting to the animal spirits, was invoking. So it had a, had a, 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 a mystical totemic reason is to um, and foster the success of the hunt, okay? And maybe even draw those animals to them. So by, by drawing them, they, it gave them some connection to the animal spirit, which they believed in, and also maybe some control over the hunt and success for the hunt. So art at that stage has this very practical function, but it it's also has a kind of a, a spiritual, um, uh, magical, magical is the best word, type of uh, purpose, okay? And, and also take note that each of these um, stages, um, there's an emphasis on, it alternates between emphasis on the individual, and then the next stage is an emphasis on the communal. All right, so this first stage is imagine this is separate, they're not really, haven't even formed tribes yet, at, at least in their beginning and middle stages. It's just every, every man for himself, you know, out there, and they, they have hardly any tribal consciousness. So it's very, you know, the primitive ego is just forming and maybe, um, you know, killing, killing others who get in your way, you know, or, or trying to steal your animal. I, I'm going to kill that animal. Someone else comes along or you're fighting over the animal and, uh, that you killed the bison and there's ended up killing, you know, one person gets killed over that, that kind of thing. It's just basic survival instinct, all right, which kind of evolves, all right, but it's, it's, it's the emphasis was on, on just the survival of the individual here. Um, and then the next stage that gradually evolves is what, what is called the purple stage. And this is where tribes and clans develop, okay? And now the emphasis is not on the individual. It's on the survival um, of the clan. The individual can only survive through the success of the clan or the tribe, okay? So obey desires of, and very connected to the spirit, spiritual realm which has started to develop there at the end of the phase. Um, very developed, very connected to mystical spirits, the spirits of the ancestors, spirits of the animals, other, you know, spirit realms that they have a connection with them. And that somehow their, the thrive, their success as a tribe depends on, on uh, acknowledging the ancestors, acknowledging these spirit beings, okay? And uh, so that's real important. So there's an allegiance to el elders, to customs, to the clan. There's a pre wanting to pre preserve sacred places, objects, rituals. Uh, people bond together to endure and find safety uh, from other tribes, because other tribes are out there. And so warring tribes. So um, not only to, uh, and also learning to hunt in groups and, and, and the men go off hunting and maybe the, well, actually women did a lot of hunting they're finding, but, there's, there's people that stay back and, uh, and, and so they they had a, uh, some kind of village life. So life in an enchanted magical village and they're seeking heart and very much in harmony with nature's power. They're in all of nature and uh, the nature gods, okay? So art here is, is totemic. And if you remember Picasso and at uh, the turn of the, ninth, of the 20th century, they were so fed up with the formality and how art had just gotten taken over by the aristocrats and it just lost its vitality. And so when Picasso and other artists you know, discovered these totem objects that were in the museums that were brought in from Africa, they just had a, um, a, a that they were going, that's it. We've, they, we wanted to return to the basic roots of art, you know, um, uh, which really came out here. And so the mask and the totems all served a, a, a function in order to, for survival, okay? So it wasn't just for aesthetic, oh, isn't that beautiful? So these objects, the, um, the, the costumes, the, the jewelry, everything had some kind of a totemic, uh, magical, sacred, mystical, divine um, uh, power. These are power objects. And these we see, you know, in the Native American peoples, even to today, if you study some of Native American culture, uh, the uh, the totem poles in this in the Northeast, etc., um, and throughout Africa, uh, Australia, you know, I, I've mentioned how how impressed I was with the Aborigine artist, contemporary Aborigine woman artist that 
the, their art is just coming from a whole different, whole different state of consciousness. And these people were, they did, they, they were so connected with nature uh, and the art it was just uh, totally different. Um, so like I said, it had the, the totemic um, magical um, purpose, all right, and power energy. And that's what Picasso wanted to capture, that his paintings or paintings should have this, have this, when you look at it, it it's magical, it has a, has a, it's not just something, oh yeah, that's a nice picture of, of Count so-and-so. No, it's alive, it's a power object. It, it has a vitality and can, the power of art, it can transform you. You know, it's not just a, it's not just a nice picture to look at. And that's, this is where this all came from. This, 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 and it's still alive today, okay? But this, so this is a stage of development that um, uh, we've all gone through, all right? So this is, um, again, individual, uh, communal, collective. And then the next stage eventually evolves is the, what they call red, okay? And this is where the individual emerges again. And, and this is, so we have all these separate tribes here, okay? All, some of them are warring, some of them are cooperating. You can think of the, uh, even think of South America with the um, the Aztecs and the Incas, okay, and all those peoples of South America. That these were very much uh, um, into the purple, but um, but also moving into red. Red is more egocentric. It's a further development of the ego. It's me, 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 and it's 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 the emergence of the tribal leader, Genghis Khan. Uh, uh, even today, uh, Saddam Hussein, um, uh, people like that, who, who, uh, where you have a country where there's warring tribes and, and a strong man emerges, the Visigoths, you know, um, uh, Tamerlane, a strong warrior emerges. He's, he's, he's the alpha male out of all these warriors. And he's so, he's so, um, uh, powerful and strong and willing to kill anybody that he, eventually they just accept him as their leader and they, they uh, give uh, subservience to him. And these are all very powerful warriors themselves, but this super warrior emerges, you know, and you see that in the, in the comics, you know, the super warrior, all right? And so it's all about them and their ego, their, their glorification of their ego. And so it's, it's they don't even, um, it's all about their reputation uh, and respect and loyalty they don't look at themselves. Uh, they'll be willing to do anything, kill anybody in order to, it's all about staying in power, okay? Back basically, and, and once they're in power, glorifying their ego. And they will fight remorselessly and without guilt to break. So, um, so they're, 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 it's like, uh, here's the world of the sacred in the purple and it's come very much down into this very extreme egocentric of gross world. Uh, Impulse. So there, there's, even though it's, 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 it's a stage of development, it seems like in some way it's a, it's a, it's a state going backwards. But what they're doing, what he's done is he's pulling together all these tribes, just like Genghis Khan did, all the various tribes in Mongolia and China. He pulled them together and, and other, other, you can think of countless, like Saddam Hussein did that. Uh, so that's it. It's like, a, it's, it's, um, it's, it's actually a state. Um, this glorification of the ego is, is a necessary stage. The ego gets strengthened. And there's leaders today in countries today. And um, anybody who knows spiral dynamics will clearly say our former president was very much red, okay? If you look at his behavior, his statements, um, what was important to him, it's red, okay? Um, and the art that comes out of that is art that enhances the, it makes, it's, it's like he's a, uh, uh, a god in a way, and it enhances his ego. And that's why they love go often gold. You know, when we looked at the um, documentary about the uh, barbarian, so-called barbarian tribes and the Visigoths, what they wanted was gold, all right? And, and they, they had a, a, a protection game going with the Romans. We won't invade you and, and, and if you give us gold. And they kept demanding more and more gold. That's what they wanted. Often the love of gold, uh, Louis XIV, the French kings, gold, gold, gold. And that includes Donald Trump's, his Trump Towers, gold, gold everywhere. Gold is the most precious, you know, metal, the most precious thing. And the more gold to have, the more glory you have, basically. And so uh, there's very beautiful art objects. The Visigoths created them, um, all made out of gold. But the main thing is to enhance the, uh, the person in power and his family. 
and uh, you know the the his his immediate people uh, to make so the royal family in Europe uh, gold gold everything you know gold and then and then the uh, the bling the jewelry and everything on the woman and the man to to make you godlike in a way so this is uh, so the art what I'm saying is. Uh, the art that comes out of that has the main purpose of glorifying the, the, the king, the queen, the, the tribal leader, the, the, the great warrior, Alexander the Great, and his family and friends, and, and to make them look so ab above and godlike everybody else. And, 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 and not just gold, but precious jewels, you know, uh, that they could find all the precious jewels they can get their hand on, you know, and making very beautiful objects. But it's it's not for the common man, you know. So, so art is getting more sophisticated, and it's serving a certain purpose here. And it's kind of it's gotten taken away from. Uh, it's, it's it's no longer the uh, totem power objects communicating with spirits and ancestors. It has a different function. Art here and and the uh, and this red stage of development. All right, so there's a beginning, a middle, and end, okay, um, late stage. So, you know, in the beginning, probably in the middle, you get the most extreme Genghis Khan type of uh, conquest. The more, the more land, the more you occupy, the more, um, and also it's just desire to stay in power. Usually, they don't have any any set um, a method for transferring power, and the leader. Uh, he might appoint a son or not. I don't always do, but the, right after he dies, there's always a, a battles between um, his his sons or different people, uh, his favorite warriors, and there's a power struggle that goes on for sometimes uh, a few years or decades until one of them emerges. It's not a, a written down uh, uh, smooth transition of power because it's all about ego and, and ego in him. And I, I started watching some documentaries about. The um, uh, what was happening in Japan in the 1600s, uh, same thing. Uh, so there was various tribes, and then uh, one super leader, I forget his name, emerged. You know, very it was very red. They were just vicious. So a lot of brutality here, and uh, uh, a killing uh, just to get your way to the top. And all right, so eventually the, there's an evolution, and maybe they start saying, "We've had enough of this." You know, all this brutality and all this egoness, ego. And so here's the, this is again, it's an alternates between the individual and the collective. So this blue phase is collective, it's communal, and it's called um, uh, purposeful meaning. Okay, so here um, there's a whole different way of, of what's valued comes out, and it's finding meaning and purpose in living, sacrificing yourself uh, to the way, whatever that way is for deferred reward, you can see Christianity here, bringing order and stability. This is one of the main things because at the red stage, there was, um, you know, chaos could break out and war could break out at any time, just based on the whim and, and um, ego, ego needs of the leader or leaders. And here it was, you know, at the purple, it was unpredictable based on magical forces or forces of nature. Here, man wants to get control and bring order and stability and control impulsivity and respond to guilt. Um, so Im impulse, aggressive impulses, sexual impulses have to be controlled here, uh, which were, they were giving full vent here in, at Red. So, um, you know, Christian, um, not just Christianity, but other, other blue cultures where, um, and even the Mayan civil, uh, culture, you, you control your individual impulses for the good of the whole, all right? And you as an individual are not that important. What is important is the, is the state or the, the religious, uh, the Catholic church, okay? And, and there's principles of righteous living, the Ten Commandments, for instance, or the, some codice of ethical behavior that everyone has to follow. And it's strictly enforced, you know? And there's a huge, a lot of judgment that goes on uh, if you're not doing it. And there's often people who are enforcers to make sure there's ethical, uh, moral laws are, are uh, and it's also very, uh, there's a change here where it becomes much more patriarchal here. Uh, and, and it's probably patriarchal here. Back in the earlier stages, it was more shared uh, matriarchal. Uh, there, are, there were no societies where the wo woman ran the show. And so it, it, it was more equally shared, but that's more likely to happen in purple. Red and, and blue particularly, it's very patriarchal. 
Okay. Uh, the divine plan assigns people to their places. So I would think of India, right? Um, the, um, um, what you want to call it? What do you call it in India? <laughs> no, I'm saying it. Uh, the, the various the positions that people are born into there. That's it for your life. And, and caste, it, caste system. The caste system. Sorry, the caste system. In Europe, if you're born into aristocracy, that's it. It's your, it's, it's your right to, so you have privileges that other people don't, okay? And, and that's all by divine will, okay? Uh, so, uh, and blue is, most people, most cultures today are blue, okay? It's still there, but it, 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 was, it emerged. And um, so Catholic church, um, the Christian Christianity, or it could be Hinduism, and it could be, it could be the uh, communism and, and the Soviet era. It's uh, China today. Uh, a lot of it, okay. Uh, so the individual, and again, if you stray, uh, you get punished. Uh, often the the Inquisition, okay. So art that emerges here is is to glorify the value system and the belief system of whatever the system is, whether it's Catholicism, it could be a religious blue, it could be a a, a political like uh, uh, Soviet art had had to be. Or even Nazi, the, you, you could say um, the Nazi um, regime. It had to be uh, reinforced. Art, artists had to do uh, sculptures and paintings and whatever that that were was like teaching and reinforcing the fundamental values that existed within this blue. So Catholic Church, it was the supremacy of Jesus and and he's he's your savior, and also scaring people through uh, paintings of hell. Uh, uh, Hieronymus Bosch, all horrible things are going to happen to you. Or painting Bible stories to keep it alive, uh, Caravaggio, all those painters, all the religious art that, if you look at European art, you could say is blue for the most part. Okay. And so, um, and, and there are censors who make sure that the art is following, whether it's sculpture, painting, or writing, is following the accepted belief system. And they will punish you if, if uh, you know, call you in and, and um, call, demand that you recant, or they prohibit the publishing of a book, or they burn your paintings if it's not, uh, you know, even to the point in the Catholic Church, if you remember that, that's interesting, they call it, the stage is called blue, because blue was so rare that it could only, uh, artists could only use blue to paint the, uh, the, um, the cloak of the Virgin Mary you know her down that's it <laughs> and if you remember titian broke the, the rule and started using blue for other uh, other figures you know oh, that was a horrible thing to do uh, so um that's they so the the, the uh, there's a great deal of control here and and the artists uh, uh Vasquez is they're painting their job is to paint the king and the royal family and, and the aristocrats okay and to promote that world order through art Okay, and so, um, and if you go away from that, you're going to pay a price. And Rembrandt is a good example of that. He was, he was, uh, um, uh, there was a certain ethical, uh, even though they were entrepreneurs, they had to be also painted in a way that looked like they were following the Calvinist, um, minimalist, uh, not materialistic religion. He was really good at that. But when he started breaking away and doing his own thing, he suffered, you know, they, he no longer had um, commissions. Uh, so this is, this. Uh, so our criticism is really censorship at this stage, okay? And censorship has, still exists in, uh, in the film industry uh, in the 30s, in, uh, literature, uh, painting, what, what was accepted. Um, the, the Impressionists were censored for uh, not doing their, it could, uh, so there's certain, there's, in other words, there's a certain way, it could, in the aesthetics field, there's a certain idea about what beauty is, okay, beauty is a certain thing, and uh, it, and, and particularly in the blue, um, beauty is um, not going to show the dirt, the ugly side of life, okay, in, in the blue realm, um, so, and uh, when people started doing, or started doing that, they caught hell, all right. So, but this is a, a, a this is a fundamentalism, 
it's a very conservative, it's like fundamentalism wants stability, it wants to preserve, and, and this is valuable. You can't just have chaos and change all the time, but it's, it's where it's, it's a reaction to the chaos and the unpredictability of the red stage of development. So we all go through this, nations go through this. Um, and, um, United States is still has, uh, you can see we still, we're, we're moved a great deal into the next stages, but we still have a great deal of blue in our consciousness, okay? Uh, and actually, if you look at the forces that, um, the conservatives in, in politically are blue, basically. Uh, and when they feel their way of life is threatened, they, they will resort to red. Now, when you go through these stages, it's not like you leave them behind. They, they're, you've been there for maybe thousands of lifetimes and those uh, uh, qualities and values and memories are buried in your subconscious. And if you feel threatened, if you, if you personally feel threatened, or if you feel your, your, your country or your, your, clan, your, um, co your country as a whole or your uh, community is threatened, you will go back in the red to defend it. You will do anything to defend it, okay? And uh, basically, that's what happened on January 6th. Uh, it was blue going back to red because of the belief that uh, what was happening was going to destroy our country. Uh, so, um, so uh, again, it's good to understand. This is the art and, and, and how people, you know, they say uh, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Uh, but what does that mean? Actually, if you look at this model, it really helps to flesh that out a little bit. The eyes of the beholder means how you perceive and how you perceive what you perceive to be um, beautiful artistically or worthwhile artistically will depend, according to this, and I agree with it, on the stage of development that you're in. Okay? And you will dismiss, usually if the, uh, particularly uh, in blue, you will dismiss anything as not worthwhile, as garbage, if it doesn't fit into that. Okay, or else you can't see it. You can just, you can maybe say, blue doesn't probably like abstract painting. You know, it's gonna like more conservative or a realism, basically would be more of, a, of an aesthetic principle um, for uh, blue. It, it's, um, it's a way of perceiving the world that's, that's uh, more conventional, okay? And, and people will define, say, this is the way it is. They will take a stand on this. This is the way art should be. This is how, um, um, man, uh, there's only uh, two genders, you know, uh, it says so in the Bible, uh, and uh, gay people or, or transgender, that they're, you know, etc. But art has to be a certain way. Art uh, should do this uh, in, in terms of what beauty is, you know, and uh, everything else gets dismissed or it doesn't get seen. And actually how we see, it really depends on uh, what you believe to be true. There's, a, there's a, an urban legend, I don't know if it's true, that uh, when um, Columbus, the first ships arrived, the Indians uh, had, were, had, uh, were in the woods there looking and they could not see the ships. That it took the shaman to be able to see the ship. It was so far out of their uh, experience. They had never seen anything like that floating on the ocean and they literally could not see it even though it was there, but the shaman saw it, saw the ships. And that happens. You really can't, you don't actually see things if it's, if it's so, so far beyond the stage where you're at. Um, you could, and, and you see that in art galleries. You see people just, if they're in blue primarily, they'll just walk by an abstract painting. They don't even see it. It's like, I don't remember it. They can't see it. Or they'll look at it and they can't see it. Um, so it, it, it could be so far. So. Uh, when you say beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, beauty is has to do with your um, acknowledgement of what's beautiful to you will be will be a lot determined by how you perceive the world, which is a lot determined by the stage of your development. Okay? It's a lens. This is a perceptual lens that colors uh, just about your uh, how you move through life and what you what you say this is good or this is not good. Okay, and that includes art. And also, so it's the kind of art that gets created, and then it's also the stage of development, how you will appreciate art uh, and what you say is, is valuable or beautiful, okay, or not. Uh, all right, so um, 
blues is, is alive and kicking. It's not bad. And that's the other thing. You can't, it's, it's like there's a lot of, um, there's a good and a, a control and a damaging to each of these. This is necessary. You know, uh, politically, um, say, um, these people. I'm here, Joe. Yeah. Oh, great. You made it. I'm glad to hear it. Okay. With my friend from Pittsburgh. All right. Thank you, friend for Pittsburgh, for helping. You me say thank you to her. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye, D. <laughs> All right. Oh my God, I'm here. <laughs> All right. All right. So, look, so uh, you, you made me lose my train of thought. I was on a roll here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I'm talking about spiral dynamics. You, uh, um, anyway, and how it relates to art. So I forget what I was saying. I was talking about blue art. Uh, anyway. Oh, I know. Just politically, you know, we're going to bring democracy to the Middle East and we have to kill Saddam Hussein and then they'll have democracy in Iraq or, or we got to kill Gaddafi. We got to we got to take him down and, we, and then they'll bring democracy to Libya. Well, look what happened. No, uh, they're not ready. And, and when you take away and here, when you take away those those countries are still in, in the red zone, uh, in the red stage of development. And when you take away the power, the strong man, uh, uh, some outside force like the United States comes in and does away with him because of our superior military power, you kill uh, Saddam Hussein or you kill Gaddafi, what happens? The country, the tribal, it regresses into tribal conflict. And now Libya is not even a country anymore since we killed Gaddafi. It's barely functioning as a country. It didn't progress towards democracy. It went backwards. And the same with uh, a lot of that's true in, uh, in Iraq, the government's struggling to get the various uh, uh, Sunni and the various Muslim, Islamic uh, factions together, the Kurdish, et cetera. It's a mess. A way to make things better, you know? So this, this uh, if you, if people, uh, if our presidents and leaders understood this, this um, stages of development, they wouldn't do foolish things like uh, taken out of tribal strongman with the assumption then they're going to embrace democracy. <laughs> Pray not, you know, <clears throat> it doesn't work that way. So, all right, so I want to keep the focus on art. So blue art is establishment art, and it could be the establishment, the French establishment, the the, the way in, in, in Paris, what was rewarded, you know, the, the, um, well, the salon, you know, and, and art uh, paintings had to be a certain way, and the, the Impressionists just broke away from that, okay, and they rebelled. And they went into orange. So this leads to orange. All right. Um, all right. So the next stage of uh, is here. Like I said, is an alternating, um, alternating uh, individual and collective community. So the blue is collective and community. And um, uh, like I said, China is a good example right now. Though China is not just blue. China is moving into orange, but a lot of blue in China, and like in the United States, in uh, Russia. Okay. And so. Uh, the next stage, you've done blue for millions of lifetimes, early, middle, late blue, and then you're starting to wake up. And now you you, you don't want to be just a, a cog in a wheel in a, in, a big or, in a big organization. You want to start expressing your own creativity. You want to, okay, so you, you're going to you go back, you're using your ego again, me, 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 but in a much more uh, much more uh, beneficial, creative way. This is just pure ego. Uh, domination. Here, it's about using your creativity and your ego for uh, for for wealth, but also for the material, for the benefit, technological benefit of, of a society or, or a whole culture or the world. Even so, there there's a striving for autonomy and independence. Uh, this is more Aquarian. You can think of it's like uh, um, you want freedom, and, and the, the American Revolution start was uh, America has a lot of orange in it. You seek out the good life, material abundance. Okay, this is what is so valuable now in our country. This is what this is what everyone tries. You know, uh, be your own boss, be successful, be creative, make a lot of money. Okay, progress through searching out the best solutions, enhance living. This is where science develops. Science and technology really comes out, and we're living in an orange culture now. Uh, all all new technology. This is Bill Gates. Um, this is. Um, uh, Amazon play to win and it's very competitive. Uh, it's learning through tried and true experience where it's very scientific uh, and it's an advancement, all right? And it, it's got 
tired of this all ultra conservatism uh, a way of living and enforce rules and punishment, et cetera, et cetera. And it's the big screw you, I'm going my way. So modern art, basically modern art is, is orange. Okay. But orange emerged early on. Um, I mean, often inside some of these great Renaissance painters, uh, Titian, Rembrandt, et cetera, they, they, they were blue in their early uh, life, but uh, they, they, grew, they grew out of it. So orange, these stages have been there, but only for very few until recently. Orange is a recent uh, development for a huge chunk of humanity. Okay? So China is certainly moving into orange. The United States certainly is. Um, Apple, uh, all the technology, you know, um, all the technology in this country and around the world. Uh, space travel, air flight, okay? And the art that emerges is modern art, okay? It's the individual now, okay? It's Picasso, it's, 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 it's uh, doing, the artist doing his thing. He's not out there to, to glorify uh, a certain religious system or the, or the kings and the queens anymore. He's just, he's just uh, it's Dolly. He's just painting for the, the creative enhancement of his own, enhancement of his ego through arts, for instance, okay? And this is where art criticism really starts to emerge now. Before it was censorship here. Now it's really like uh, uh, the, the modern art critics uh, have uh, emerged. And this, this is really a recent development since the early 19th century or late, ninth, late 19th century uh, with the impression that art criticism was coming about Ruskin, etc. But it's, you know, it's really developed through, through here. So um, still, it's, uh, it's, it's about the ego. But it's a higher it's a higher expression of the ego, okay. And um, the the downside of orange it's like it's very competitive. It's not very ecological, uh, uh, you know. Through all the it's corporate it's corporations, um, and all the downside of corporate um, pollution, polluting the environment, um, and taking advantage of uh, for just for the sake of profit, taking advantage of employees. And early industrial age, just employees being in these horrible, horrible working conditions, and that's that's gradually evolved, improving. But still, it, there's still issues. You know, when you read about what happens at Amazon fulfillment centers or other places like that, or sexism, uh, glass mirrors, and a, a progressive organization like Google, uh, etc. So you know. Um, it's still masculine, still male dominated to a large extent. Although more and more women uh, have are emerging here as pioneers in their fields in in, in orange, Woman, uh, women's movement uh, starting to emerge here. But uh, female painters, you know, the women are, are finally breaking through in the arts. The female artists we've studied, uh, some of them did in the Renaissance. We we study some of the great uh, who are little known. Uh, those uh, women Renaissance, so some of them were there, but just a very small number of people uh, had access to it. But here, it's it's available to a big chunk of the population now. Okay, big chunk of the population, um, and you know the uh, Microsoft was a brutal competitor. Uh, Bill Gates in his in his thirties when they were, when he was getting uh, Microsoft into a dominant position. He was brutal from what I read about him. You know, they would, they would stomp on their, they, they were out to destroy their competitor. It was like, a, it was like a, a, you're out on a, on a football field or you're out to kill your competitor. So it's not like love and peace. <laughs> uh, you know, like I said, it's very ego driven. Um, and there's many benefits for the world that have come through, through this, many, many benefits uh, with technology and the development of science and all the great art that has emerged. But there's, there's still, because it's very ego-based, uh, there's a tendency to want to uh, not look at the whole picture, not look at, and to deny the negative consequences of what you're doing, what global corporations are doing, uh, the negative effect on uh, the environment or society, you know, the rich, the rich, the rich, 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 and the poor, 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 getting poor, you know, uh, the unequal distribution of, of, of uh, Resources, you know, it's basically a winner takes all, you know. Uh, so if you're a competitor and that's it. Uh, so, uh, but that, you know, people look at Bill Gates, he's gone through so much development. You know, this whole thing now is, is I know there's always conspiracy theories about Gates. I don't buy it. And he's, I, he's got his, he believes in vaccines. That's fine. 
I believe he believes he's doing good for the world. His foundation, you know, billions of dollars. So a lot of these people do evolve towards becoming more social conscious and uh, actually do quite a bit of good with their money. Uh, in Warren Buffett, you know, so, um, they're, they've, they've, they're not giving it to their children. They're giving it to, uh, to Bill Gates Foundation, Buffett's billions of dollars. So uh, anyway, um, the art here can be competitive. Uh, but it's very much, you know, when you think I want to be an artist, I want to be a successful, I want to express myself, me, 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 uh, and look at me, I'm a great artist, and that need, that desire, whether it be on stage or look at my paintings, or aren't they wonderful? Uh, and I want to go to art school, I want to be recognized. All that's the orange. And, and that's, it's good, it's healthy, it's, it's a breakthrough, but it's, it's still coming from the ego, <laughs> okay? It's, it's like Leo as astrologically, okay? And, and Leo and Aquarius. Okay. Uh, so, and but I say art criticism then uh, emerges here in full flower. So uh, there's an awareness that uh, art doesn't have to be a certain way. And the art critics are saying that they encourage innovation. They, they encourage uh, what's new. Uh, it's progressive. It's cutting edge. It's avant-garde. All that becomes encouraged because we don't want to go back art. All right, so we don't want to go back and be like these critical centers or the, the, the uptight uh, art critics of the 19th century, you know, so MoMA, et cetera, and this, uh, this openness to, to whatever um, uh, progressive art is there. And, and, and experimentation, artists trying, we looked at artists who were, who were experimenting with different materials, plastics, you know, uh, collage, you know, that wasn't true in the 19th century, this kind of art. Uh, it was gold, but but taking discarded materials, trash, and converting that into art, uh, junk, etc. You know, all that is is coming out of orange. The, the desire to, um, and, and also being influenced by science, like Dolly was, and and it's looking at more than ever before. They not because of all the breakthroughs in science and breakthroughs in psychology, Freud, Carl Jung, etc. It's that had a big impact on what artists want to express. It's more. Art becomes more inward here, more psychological here, okay? And, and Dolly wanting to express in Picasso the unconscious, okay? It's, a, it's, the, it's the beginning levels of connecting to the unconscious, all right? So, uh, uh, so, the, so the whole way of perceiving changes about what's beautiful, what's, what is art? It's all up for grabs now. What is art? All the old assumptions that particularly in the blue stage, are all thrown out the, the window and rethought. And, and some of it's a desire to go back to, to, the, to the purple stage of, of reconnecting with the roots of the artistic when it first flowered in Canaan and, and, and sacred. And you still see that in the world today. We're not, the artists we're, we're going to look at, hopefully it'll be time. Um, OK, and then um, the next stage, this is individual. Here we are. The next stage is, is we're back in the communal, green. And it's just what it is. It's it's suddenly um, <clears throat> the whole green movement is is a, a next stage of development. It's a explore the inner beings of self and others, promote a sense of community and unity, uh, communal living, the sharing society's resources, liberate humans from greed and dogma, reach decisions through consensus, refresh spirituality, and bring harmony. Okay, so there's there's a, a tremendous awareness of environmentalism. Uh, uh, the Gaia movement, um, fighting. Uh, uh, you notice how people, Greens love meetings. They're always in meetings. They're always doing things as groups. Here, it's all individual. It's the individual. It's Bill Gates, you know, and his thing. Here, it's all, you know, meeting, meeting, meetings, uh, uh, groups of green people doing things, making decisions. It's, it's very communal oriented. Uh, and the art that comes out of that is, has, a, has um, it's, it's influenced by uh, a concern for the, the environment, for the ecology, for social justice is coming about, all the, the whole movement towards social justice, uh, uh, women's rights. Uh, today's uh, Women's Day, right? So it's, uh, I think, so that um, equal rights, uh, uh, sexual slavery, all, so every A to Z of social justice is green, okay? And there's an art. The art is there to um, promote that. You know, the art that's that's to heighten our awareness of social injustice, uh, political injustice, injustice, environmental art, 
uh, is now starting. It's not just about making, you know, painting a beautiful landscape for, for the sake of it. It's about to uh, point out, to teach. Before it was teaching, here it was teaching spiritual beliefs and, and uh, Catholic beliefs. Here it's about to uh, elevate our awareness of the, um, our connectedness and what's going on with the environment. And so, so you see, and there's also uh, getting away from elite art and bringing it down to everybody can share. So uh, you see the advent of um, murals in cities and um, uh, graffiti is green, you know? And, uh, yeah, so that art for everybody. So any, everybody can be an artist. <laughs> It's a great leveling of elitism. It's it's no longer uh, the blue is hierarchical. I should have mentioned that it's highly hierarchical. The military, the Catholic Church, you know, it's hierarchical. Here it's it's rebelling against hierarchy for the individual. But now this is more of a network. It's not just the individual out on on his own exploring. Now this is realizing that um, it, it's a network, like the internet. It's a, the internet here. It's a it's a network. So. Art reflects that awareness, that consciousness, okay? And it's about using materials, uh, sustainable materials, um, um, and to promote sustainability, etc. cetera. Uh, it's still, there's ego here. I mean, they, you get like the um, Greenpeace, you know, going and some of the uh, more uh, militant uh, social activists, environmental activists, they're, you know, these are the, these people here in orange and blue, particularly orange, they're, they're at war with them because these people here are destroying the environment. And they're just uh, promoting their policies, their, their global corporations are, are damaging societies, particularly in poor countries, you know, et cetera. So these people, Greens are out uh, to, to uh, actually literally sometimes do battle, stop them from fishing or stop them from uh, the Navy from using sonar, you know, protect the whales, all that. But so the art, a lot of the art, green art is about that, but it's a great leveling of art. So everybody's an artist. And then it, it begins to, it's like you begin to, um, the idea that, that only you had to go to art school and only um, have a great technical skills. Now it's like somebody can pick up a spray can spray and, and do a graffiti and, and uh, uh, it's art, okay? And, um, so what that what happens here at this level is uh, differentiating, and he, and everybody's equal. And even you would hear like let's say um, there's different kinds of intelligence. So someone with Down syndrome and someone who graduates from Yale, super intelligent. Well, they just they're all equal. They just have a, a different kind of intelligence. You hear that phrase. Greens like to say, well, they're just different. Yeah, and it's like you don't put them into a hierarchy as being better or worse. They're just different. Okay, that's a common. Um, so what greens are good at is differentiating and accepting. Okay, uh, at that level. So, but off, but um, each, you know, each, each uh, uh, stage tend to distrust and dislike the one next to them. Okay, so green doesn't like orange because of the mess they make. Uh, blue is threatened by uh, orange because uh, they're breaking the rules. You know. Uh, so, and often they go to war with each other. Uh, so, you know, orange can, and blue can, you know, tree huggers, you know, all that. <laughs> uh, or just deny, you know, they'll, they'll deny global climate change because it, because it comes back on their profit, etc. All right. So, um, then something happens, something incredible happens that this is all, uh, according to the spiral dynamics, all first tier thinking stages. We all go through every society. And uh, right now, you know, orange is really prevalent. And, and you know, we have a great, let's say United States, blue still very prevalent, probably half the population, but orange, uh, at least a quarter, lots of green has emerged in, since uh, the 60s. Okay. <clears throat> then second tier, and there, uh, where there's uh, three, yellow, turquoise, and coral, okay. And something new happens. This is, um, uh, at the second tier uh, of the yellow stage, it's a shift of consciousness that it's 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 a meta stage. It's a meta. Uh, it's ability to look at the whole thing. 
it's like uh, say reading God speaks and look at the whole process of the whole evolution of consciousness. And you're no longer so totally identified with, with the value system of your particular stage of development. It's almost unconscious your that you're in this stage. Here you can at stage two, there's an, uh, a new level of ability to stand back and see uh, a kind of connectedness and a kind of and see the whole evolution. And, uh, and, and so you're not so tied into one perspective. It's multi-perspectival here. It's a it's a it's an advance. It, it's um it's where um, uh, mindfulness I think comes in. Here's some of the some of the accept the inevitability of nature's flows and forms. Focus on functionality, competence, flexibility, very flexible. Uh, discovering personal freedom without harming others. Okay, in our in our ends that they just blocked out the harm they're doing. Okay. Uh, without harming others or too much self experience a fullness of living on earth and and, um, and demand integrative and open sy systems thinking systems thinking starts to emerge in green but it really reaches its full capacity and uh, everything is related in a system our nature everything all science now is based on systems thinking the interaction of different um, elements creates a whole that's bigger than the sum of the parts okay um, so, and art that emerges, yellow art, we're going to, the person uh, we're going to see in a little bit, I would, well, you'll see. Uh, there's, a, there's a different way of understanding art. It's, a, it's, it's about the process of art. It's about um, uh, drawing on, on earlier forms of, of artistic expression, carrying it forward, oftentimes going back to the purple realm. Uh, it's about um art that art that is also has a deeper spiritual dimension and i think we looked at agnes um um what's her name god i'm so getting so bad name uh agnes more was it yeah the 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 uh, artist who does the stripes the beautiful stripes but um um uh, yeah her and there's a spiritual dimension to art that emerges here because it's going it's going deeper within and you know, the early explorations into the unconscious by Picasso, by Dolly, others, you know, they're, they're not, they're not, those people, they're just into their uh, imagination. They're coming out with a lot of bizarre imagery, uh, a lot of create, a lot of um, disjointed imagery, a bit like nightmares, but here it's deeper, you know, now that the spirituality is gone, it's going even, even deeper. Um, Agnes Martin, that's me, yeah. Um, and Rothko. Uh, and even artists like at the end of the career, Monet, I talked about him, he, he got was into, he was, he was um, um, started off as yellow, blue, he moved into uh, with impression and the orange, he may have gotten in green and he, he was stepped into yellow, he was going into the spiritual realm. Uh, uh, so individual artists can go there, have gone there throughout history, but now, uh, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Ken Wilber. He's an American philosopher, considered New Age. He doesn't like that term. Uh, his model is called integral model. He said, I was listening to a talk by him the other day, and he said that this second tier fully emerged for a big chunk of humanity, and by that, at least 10% of humanity in the 1960s. I thought that was really fascinating uh, because he said it was there before, but but there was a humanity got a push into this second level, and he said that's not just his opinion. There's been all and and all this sociological research to show that a new consciousness emerged in the 1960s, and that they're calling it yellow. Now, um, for those of you who are uh, us who are followers of Mayor Bob, that's exactly what he said he came to do. He did, it was to push everyone along, and it's interesting. It was the 1960s where he was his work was really starting to manifest. And, and, and here you get a clear idea of exactly what he, exactly in detail, the, what it was he, uh, he was doing in terms of where he pushed people. People didn't get pushed, the average person didn't get pushed on to the realms of sainthood. They, if they were, uh, it's like humanity, a new tier of consciousness opened up for gross conscious human beings, okay? Um, which is multi-dimensional, multi-perspectival, okay? Uh, not, judging, being less judgmental. And, and it's not that you don't take a stand, but it's it's understanding that there are stages of development, understanding the various stages of, of development and accepting them, okay? Um, 
Okay. And so the art that emerges about this is, is has a, a spiritual dimension to it, uh, which is a continuation of, I think, the, the earlier stages of uh, purple okay, in, a, in a really deep way. So spiritual art, visionary art, uh, and um, how you, it means that as an art person who loves art, you're, you're looking at it different. You're looking at art differently. You can see that, uh, that inner realms are important. That, that you're more interested in the inner realm, okay? And you want art that, that uh, you appreciate art that does that. And it's not just nice paintings of landscapes anymore. Uh, so art that breaks through that into the inner is, is becomes a, a value to you. And you begin to see it differently because you're seeing different art. Um, and you're seeing the connectedness. And, and uh, that uh, I think the Aborigine art, the woman Aborigine, I think that's where these people were coming from. Well, oftentimes native, art is uh, a contemporary native art is really tapping into this second tier uh, of art and, and um, in, a, in a really powerful way. And it's so different than um, say impressionism, etc. And then the next realm is even a deeper degree of spirituality. It's, the, it's a total global uh, turquoise. It's, it's mysticism, global networking. Uh, it's, it's striving for spiritual consciousness. It's my, you know, it's mindfulness, um, and and so this was individual. This was collective green. This is more individual now. This is much more, you know, the spiritual community uh, at turquoise. Okay, that that we are one. The global oneness is is very turquoise. Now we're all connected. We're all one at the soul level. Okay. And that the art that emerges from this and the ability to perceive art is coming from that state of consciousness. And you're still in the gross world, but I think, uh, and then there's a further, which I haven't even talked about too much is the, the coral, they're just researching it. Probably coral will take you right to the edge of the subtle world. I think this is where you begin to leave the, uh, at, at the final stage of coral, you leave the gross consciousness and you step into the soul. Okay, so I think this is an incredible model that covers a, a whole development of individuals and in whole societies uh, through gross consciousness. Okay, and these you have to go through these stages, even though some of them are, uh, you know, are really brutal and ruthless and uh, a lot of killing that gets done. And that's just the way it got set up, you know. Uh, and so, what I'm saying is so think of the, also there's lines of development through each of these. So there's a there's an intellectual cognitive line of development. There is a emotional intelligence line of development. There's an aesthetic line of development. There's a spiritual religious line of development. And so and so in an individual, they're all not in the same place. You could be really advanced. Your cognitive line of development could be in orange, but your spiritual line of development could be could be in blue. Okay. So they they're not all evenly lined up. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so, which is interesting. Uh, so, when a person, art wise, when a person talks about what they like in art, what they don't like, you know, uh, if you use this model, you can say, well, where are they coming from? What, what stage of development are they coming from? Okay, in terms of how they're perceiving what, you know, lies in beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder, which means that they're at a certain, the perceptual ability is, is determined by the value system of the stage of development that they're in. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so, and also, um, Ken Wilmer makes a really a great point spiritually that uh, there's a difference between awakening and growing, awaking up and growing up. Growing up is psychological ego development that happens along here, but waking up spiritually can happen at any stage here. You can have a spiritual experience at, at the beige stage, but what you do with that will depend on your stage of development. So if you have a, a, a powerful spiritual experience in, in say, uh, early blue, that might, you may take that, I mean, you're going to go out and uh, convert the rest of the world. And if they don't, uh, you know, that my, my way is the right way, my religion, and if they don't follow it, then they're heathens or you kill them, you know, uh, but you've had this powerful opening. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, it just depends. Uh, but, but spiritual experience is, is an awakening can happen at any stage of development. Okay. Uh, but but there, the psychological growth uh, maturity follows some pretty, uh, well, uh, so you could be 
you can have a very powerful spiritual experience, but not be very developed psychologically. Is what I'm saying, and what you do with it will be determined by that. Um, so, I mean, you can't you can't separate art. Uh, you, art it flows from every culture, flows out of individuals. So, um, it's fascinating to look at how art itself and our ability to appreciate art is evolves along through these stages. Okay. Um, so, any before I what, how are we doing? I want to. Uh, I wish I had more time. I wish I had another hour and a half. But I want to show you this artist, and it's, she's who I discovered recently. And uh, you decide where she's coming from. Okay. But any comments on this? Any thoughts? Or what do you think of it? And I, like I said, there is lots of information on the internet about this. Now, I just I've known about spiral dynamics for years, and just in the last two months, I discovered this guy who who I like and um, actualization.org. He's on YouTube, and he has an hour and a half, two hour descriptions talks on each of these stages <laughs> so like i said this is just a tip tip of the iceberg he go and he gives lots of examples of countries cultures and individuals but the value system and it goes into great detail i listened to everyone in the last two months and and really deepened my understanding of these uh, stages of development so um, <clears throat> they're on so the information is there so uh, Joe, did you say actualization.org? Is that what I actual, type? Actualize, actualize.org. Actualize.org. But even if you just type in spiral dynamics, he'll come up, you'll see. It. It's a guy just who just talks, his face is right, and he's good. He's a really good speaker. And uh, he goes through every stage. I like, I love everything he said, except one thing. And I'll warn you, when he gets to the higher stages, if you do this, he, he believes that taking LSD and ayahuasca is good. And so that's the only thing I don't, we know that's not true. And that's Baba said, stay away from that. But he, he thinks that's good. But everything else he said is amazing. He's a really good speaker and presenter. So if you can forgive him for that mistake, um, I recommend listening to him. Okay. If you, if you want to go into more uh, un deeper understanding of this. Okay. The last thing I want to say to this, this is important. This is not just a theoretical model. Um, the um, Don Beck, and his other guy, um, it's a it's a model for change, and it's been applied in the world into uh, political hotspots, sometimes very successfully. And um, this is a true story. Um, in in the late eighties, you know, you ever wonder why in South Africa apartheid they just let it go? Uh, the apartheid government, the clerk, they just released Nelson Mandela suddenly, and they allowed for a free election, knowing the apartheid white uh, government, <laughs> knowing full well. That the majority of people in South Africa are black, that they're voting themselves out of power forever. And they just let that happen after decades and decades of oppression and, and the brutal things they were doing to, to the uh, native people there. And suddenly they just they just dropped it. It's like, huh? And that coincided with the at the same time with the with the Berlin Wall coming down, and communism falling. So there, there's something else going in, on in the world at that time. But what I do know is that. Uh, spiral dynamics had some influence on what happened in South Africa, and not I mean, certainly it's not the whole thing. But the Clark had hired um, uh, Don Beck to be a consultant for the South African government at that time, and over for several years. So something must have been the Clark was the last apartheid uh, president, and something must have been happening with him to be even willing to do that. You know, he must have been had some uh, spiritual experience or waking up. Why was he doing this? You know. And, uh, and so um, one thing that um, people who study this model as a, as a organizational or individual change model, what they say is you, uh, the way to influence people to change, you have to understand the stage they're at and you have to pitch where you want them to go to just beyond where they're at. If you come at them from a too high a level, they will dismiss you. It's too far. So what was happening in South Africa, the United Nation was condemning them from an ethical apartheid, from an ethical moralistic point of view, and there was an embargo. And they, the apartheid government, F you. They didn't care. Uh, they, you know, it did not ma matter. But uh, so there's a lesson there. People will not listen to you if you if you come at them uh, from a, a a, a stage of development that's too far beyond them. So if you can just pitch it to where are they, they're going to evolve. Where are they evolving to? What's the next stage, even within blue or within our, what's the next stage from beginning, middle, end of that? Where are they going? And if you can be aware of that and you pitch it to that and they will see that, hey, you're like me in a lot of ways, but you're new. Okay. And they will be more willing to accept. This applies to uh, uh, individual 
trying to change individuals also applies to groups in the whole. So what what the what I know um, what Don Beck did with South Africa is one of the things he did is he wrote a series of articles that appeared in the Sunday Johannesburg Times over quite a number of months or a year, and he did just that. And they are very blue culture naturally. And, uh, um, he appealed to their selfish interests. And basically, what, I didn't read the articles, but I think the gist of it was that the world is becoming global, global economy, and uh, you're going to be left out. You're going to you're going to lose. Yeah, yeah. You can go. You can cheat on the embargo, which they're doing, but it's just going to get worse for you. Sorry, you know the world is changing. You're behind the eight ball. You keep apartheid. Uh, it's not working. And 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 he explained to them how they're going to suffer as a result uh, economically and and not as he didn't come at them from an ethical moral point of view. And somehow that made sense because it's like he knew what their next stage of development was was going to be, and he appealed to that. And so that was one of the factors. Certainly, I thought for the apartheid government to suddenly tell release Nelson Mandela and say you can have a free election, there, there could have been the bloodiest civil war there possible. It was avoided. It was peaceful transfer of power. It's amazing. So, and they've also used this in the Middle East and, and with the Israelis and Palestinians. And there was a project they were doing, but it lost funding. I think during the uh, last administration. Too bad. <clears throat> okay. So what I'm trying to say in this spiral dynamics. Is a, is a way of understanding yourself, other people, uh, your own development, but it also has a very practical applications in the world for conflict, individual or collective conflict. So it's pretty amazing. Um, so, all right, so um, that all said, boy, I wish I had more time. So I'd stumbled on this artist the other day, uh, accidentally. Uh, I don't know if any of you ever heard the Incredible String Band from the 60s. Uh, it was a Scottish group, and they were really original. I, I love them, and uh, they were part of the scene of the '60s. And a friend of mine who I had gone to a few of their concerts and with a friend of mine, and she emailed me the other two weeks ago and said, uh, uh, "One of the band members' his name was Rose Simpson." And she goes, "Hey, Rose just published an autobiography." And I said, "Oh, cool!" So I went on YouTube and I go and Rose Simpson, and and there she was. But I saw there was another Rose Simpson up there at the top of YouTube. I go, "Who's that?" And said, Rose Simpson, um, Santa Fe artist. And, and, and so, oh my God. And it's this, I, I have fallen in love with, with this woman. She is amazing, and I think. So I want to present her as the artist for today. And maybe we'll have more time next week. Um, so I want you to listen to her and try to think where she's coming from and stay to those stages of development. Okay. Well, let me see the best one to pick out. I'll just, I've got a lot of short ones here. Um, Let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, just listen to her. Uh, and we're still on uh, share screen, I hope. Uh, Clay, uh, he's a Native American. Um, he's uh, from New Mexico. This series? And a sculpture, Clay sculpture, sculptress. It is. Um, um, titled Beholding um, Contradiction. And it really comes from a time where I was um, really having to sit with myself about um, not looking at things um, really um, in high contrast, like in black and white, or seeing things with, the, with really strong judgmental intensity. Um, and part of that was how do you sit with I can feel one way and another at the same time, and it's okay. And that becomes this balancing act of, of being constantly conscious of that decision to stay um, aware of how, you know, I'll say me, perceive the world and interact with others and build a relationship and um, build a relationship to my life and that story that's continuing um, in a proactive sense. Um, and the reason I made these pieces this way was because I wanted them to balance in that um, uh, specific way that sort of is a pendulous moment um, in that relationship. Um, this bottom piece was um, a coil built in the top of slap slap, so the weight is down below and, and the moment where the, the metal piece enters the back of the piece is very tender and it's very, um, it reflects to me that, that um, 
the sort of tenuousness of staying in that moment without falling one way or the other. Um, and then the things that are, that are adorning the pieces themselves represent those things that tend to throw us off balance. Um, and, and again, these are um, um, like, I call them power objects or energy, uh, moments of energy where I, I put intention and, and um, care and uh, belief into these pieces. So they're not just physical um, weight, weighted moments, but they're also intentions that are, that are adorned onto the piece, as with every moment that's tied onto it with every uh, piece of, of leather or found objects. Um, and um, there, were, there were originally three in the series. Um, um, the black one was a collaboration with Watermelon7, um, who, who uh, was part of this conversation in creating this process and this idea. Um, and so he wrote actual English words in gold luster on pieces that hung, um, and and um, those this large piece um, is uh, well, the the largest one, and so that the emphasis is is probably the biggest, the most weight that I feel it carries, um, and and actual clay adornments on it are are pretty heavy, um, and then the the white one is is very is light is lighter in that energy, but it also has. Uh, more of the, the scales and the balance. And I'm a Libra, so it's probably connected. <laughs> um, this piece is um, the next part of the directed series. Um, I covered all the different directions and this one is um, the next step of, of directed center. And this one is about sort of going to the next layer in center. And part of that is um, creating um, and preparing self to um, be able to um, manage in a healthy way and be able to be responsible for the future that may come. And one of those things are two important symbols, which is the star and the protection, the roadrunner track. And this is direction and this is protection. Um, and this piece moves forward in the world and finding that part within ourselves that is not only directed and follows the stars, but also is protected in our journey forward wherever we may go, whatever challenges we may meet, that we are blessed with that awareness of what we carry within and the strength of self. Um, this piece um, is kind of a reflection of, of that which I'm trying to build within myself right now. And, it's a, and it feels um, raw and vulnerable in the way that it was made, but it's also ready and ready to go and do this. So it's a good piece for me. Let me play one more and I'll get some comments. Uh, I initially went up to Denver um, to explore a new uh, series of work that I was really interested in pursuing, and that was working on empowering the 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 self and the and the and the body the physical manifestation of self with um, um, armor or uh, objects of adornment that could be worn and experienced by um, myself and others. I did this by creating busts, um, life-size busts in my studio um, in Santa Clara and <clears throat> then um, welding bases for them so that they were at different heights of, of, of life size. So I would sit down in the morning in the studio and I would do sketches and I would draw and then I would begin to cut the leather and to um, form these pieces that would potentially be used on the busts themselves and also um, preparing for the performance that would be the culmination of this uh, experience at the Denver Art Museum. 
meanwhile, as I traveled up to Denver, I would travel back down to New Mexico, back to Española, and I was working on refinishing a 1985 El Camino and making this car into an object of power, a power object. And um, the intention or one of the ideas behind the residency was to be able to bridge this power, power object or this powerful thing that is the car with the vessel that is the body empowered as well and that being um, a juxtaposition that I just really wanted to experience. So the armor um, that I was creating was loosely based on um, the black on black pottery that comes from my Pueblo, from Santa Clara Pueblo and the adjacent um, communities including San Ildefonso Pueblo. With the leather I was able to use the smooth surface as well as the rough surface of the leather to mimic that. This same idea I transferred to the vehicle, um, also being a vessel. I made seven of these busts in all, um, and each of them were to represent the seven different directions, that is north, south, east, west, up, down, and center. Um, through the process, I began to contact different people who would then eventually be my performers or my models. Um, <clears throat> and in working with these people, I began to sort of um, configure the pieces around who these people are. The seven models, one was me, adorned ourselves in the outfits. And while I drove the car up through the plaza, the, the six different models walked on either side of the car together up towards the building. We then parked the car with the heartbeat playing still out of the sound system and took a moment to honor the seven directions. After that point, we reconvened and walked up to the third floor Sovereign exhibition where my work uh, is being shown. Um, at that point, we took a moment and acknowledged the work. This was what I instructed the models to do, was to take a moment and, and notice what it was like to be the work, and notice what it was like to be the work in, in action, in life, versus the work that had been made stagnant still. And I, I began to walk back out, and everyone followed me down and out the building where we then climbed into the back of the car, or everyone climbed into the car, and we drove off the premises together in the car. The heartbeat creates a vessel out of the car. We are a vessel, the car is a vessel, the pottery is a vessel. We carry forth with us what we nurture ourselves in the world with, and we are utilitarian objects in an aesthetic experience. The heartbeat was very interesting while driving. It's always nerve nerve wracking to put oneself in the public eye. And as I was driving the El Camino forth into the plaza area, I could feel my heart beating, and the car was bumping out this heartbeat. And I, and it was really really intense. <laughs> it was it intensified the experience? Um, so. I always wonder if performance creates uh, sort of a heightened sensibility because there's a little bit of fear in that power. So, um, so far, I just want to ask you, um, in the, the sculptures of hers that you saw and listening to her speak, what stage of development do you think she's at? Where's her art coming from based on that spiral dynamics? Green into aqua. Green into tur turquoise. Turquoise. Well, there's yellow, there's green, yellow, turquoise. Okay, so yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, I find it interesting that the color of the turquoise that they put on this chart before the spiral dynamics is very close to Baba's final color of huh. the aqua blue at the top of the flag. You know, so, would you, do you think she's other, you can have whatever other colors you want, he said, but red at the bottom and that beautiful 
bluish turquoise color at the top. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. I'm yeah. Hard. Do you think she's at a second tier level of um, creative expression and consciousness? I don't remember what second tier is, but it brought me to tears. All right. Well, the second tier is a, is a major shift in consciousness where the person is uh, reflecting on uh, their, their own development, their own awareness, their own inner processes, and universalizing them. Okay. And you're seeing that, and it's a way of, there's a sense of connectedness with everything. There's a spiritual quality to it. There's the ability to stand back and observe yourself with some sense of detachment. Uh, that's all second tier. Oh, so, definitely second tier then. Huh? Yeah. There's definitely, really, second there's tier. definitely some green in her, but I, but I, 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 when I found her, I thought this, she's really, I think, pretty amazing human being. Yeah. Um, well, for, she said she learned, she grew up without, on a reservation without electricity and they grew their own food. They were dirt poor. And so she, the kind of like the Aborigine, uh, um, very little contact with, um, but more than the Aborigines in Australia, those contemporary artists. Um, but she said at age 12, she was able to um, uh, rebuild a car engine. <laughs> She's, she rebuilt that car, uh, rebuilt the engine. And, and so uh, she's got this, all the bases covered. She's like this warrior, but her, um, her and she's taking the native uh, purple culture, Native American, and they're very, they're very much into using dolls, you know, the Kachina dolls of the, and, and bringing them, uh, raising them up to a higher level of her, her, um, her sculptures to have universal significance in, 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 a, in a modern way, but, but her, I, I'm just so impressed with her self-awareness and ability to articulate. And that ability that she says to stand in that moment of contradictions, you know, that's yellow. To, to not identify with either one, that first sculpture, that moment of balance, that precarious moment, that is such a yellow statement that takes a certain degree of mindfulness, okay? So what I'm saying is uh, this model works for listening to artists. Let me just, uh, uh, we'll look at more of her. Do you, do, you, do you enjoy her work? Do you like her work? Personally, I, I was just so deeply moved and touched. I'm inspired and I'm awed and I'm dumbfounded. It's just a yeah, so That's what I felt about her. I couldn't believe her. I know. Uh, Thank yeah. you for showing this, my God. Yeah, okay. So um, she's amazing, I think. And she went, oh, um, she went, she started out, um, her mother's an artist. So she grew up with art, but uh, she ended up going, getting accepted to the Rhode Island School of Design. You know, starting with nothing. And that's one of the most prestigious art schools in the country. Um, and uh, she graduated from there, you know, so she's, she's uh, covered all the bases. I'm, I feel like really lucky because um, my mom, uh, who's also an artist, was um, incredibly um, revolutionary when I was a kid. And she basically decided to make no money and grow all our own food and live entirely off the land. Um, and we were homeschooled, so we didn't, we didn't have electricity, um, but we lived on the res, so we had like running water. Um, and we grew all our own food. And, you know, <laughs> we went to the dump and got old tires and made shoes and stuff like that. And so my, I think I have an interesting perspective because I've lived this interesting sustainable thing, which I feel is very much decolonized, right? Um, and work. even though like now it'd be like, oh, those are just Indian hippies, you know what I mean? And I'm like, no, that's actually true cultural preservation when you're like, no, we're saving our indigenous seeds because they grow here. And we're figuring out if it all falls apart, how to live without the system, without Western culture, without, um, all the, you know, the um, privileges of living in this world, right? Um, and so, as a kid, you know, we spent all our time, like, irrigating the fields and picking beans and weeding and, and like, you know, um, actually understanding how to live that. And, and I think that became my preoccupation with um, post-apocalyptic theory because I felt very torn because I knew that you can live, you know, 
completely sustainable off, out, off the system. I'm not even talking solar panels. I'm talking no electricity, you know what I mean? No TV, no refrigerator. And, um, you know, we had bees for candles, you know? Um, and I felt like we were the only ones doing that in the 80s, right? Um, and so it was very lonely and people looked at us weird and, you know, we were dirty all the time. Like we were these like dirty kids who would barely ever make it into town and go to the grocery store, you know? And it was like, I felt like it wasn't where I was at. And I felt like sustainability for me, to be honest, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, we're going to save the world and recycle our cans, right? We're going to save the world and... Um, you know, buy a Prius, I'll go buy a Prius <laughs> oh, <laughs> But like, um, it made me feel like true sustainability is how you feel inside yourself. And when you talk about like, um, like patterning and pattern understanding and how the natural world works and how indigenous systems really were about, that it was rooted first and foremost in spirituality and the way that you walk through the world and how you see the world. And it's not about, I like to say like, like white hippie unconsciousness where I'm gonna walk into the room and stink and not, <laughs> I don't know, excuse me for saying this, but like, you know, it's not about that. It's actually something bigger and it's about um, our psychological space as we make these decisions. And so, because I felt like I was this one kid on the res who was growing all their own food, didn't have a TV, right? And like, my cousin next door was going to McDonald's and was watching MTV, you know? And I felt like it wasn't honest where we were at. And so I felt like my work had to be, I had to back all the way up and, and be a social person and be honest about how indigenous people are living now and be conscious of that and be a part of that as part of that world. And then without denial and without denying the social world that we build as social people in a, in a social realm um, and start sort of transforming the way people think and start going back to true sustainably from the inside out, not from the outside in, like ideas of what you should be doing and what, you know, this and that because you want to deep, deep down in your heart um, um, to feel healthy and that you start noticing like, when I walk into Walmart, I feel horrible. And when I eat McDonald's, I feel sick, you know? And that like, that starts with a true consciousness of yourself. Um, and until we can remember to be conscious again, we can't even make those healthy decisions. So I feel like, my work and the, the way that I feel like I'm honoring that, understanding that plants and animals are always dying to make space for me on this planet every single day. And I have to do that justice. And everything I make um, is using resources. This was someone's skin. And I am conscious of that when I use it. It's, it's not like uh, this object. This is somebody. So is this. And so is this, right? This is wood, this is reed, this is clay. So is the metal. This is all somebody. And as I work, I want to give it as much intention and heart and, and dedication to my belief as I can so that I make this life, the end of this life, to turn this into leather. You know, I give it justice so that as the world comes back around, I'm not wasting these resources or living unconsciously as much as I can. What's your interest in found objects? You have a lot of pieces that you collect. I was, um, my mom uh, was really interested in permaculture, which is the study of sustainable living systems. And so I'm really um, interested in how, well, I'm really interested in post-apocalyptic theory. Like how do we, how are things going to look and how is that going to transform our aesthetic when we're more, we have more agency and we have more uh, creative possibility because of the limits of not being able to be consumer culture. Um, and so I'm really excited about like how do you repurpose objects and um, just push yourself and 
think of all the options and just like, like I think the creative, um, the creative mind is a is a is a muscle. You know, like creativity is a muscle, and you're like, oh, what could I do with this? You know, and how can I push it? And how can I um, make it be what I want it to be and say what I want what I want it to say? And like people say, how is an El Camino like permaculture? If it, you know, runs around. 10 miles per gallon maybe, if that, right? Um, and so I'm always like, it's recycled, <laughs> you know? It's, it was made in 1985, you know? It was used for many years before I found it and turned it into something else and re-loved it into its new form. And um, guaranteed as much fuel as that car uses, it won't be as much fossil fuels it takes to build a brand new Prius. So, to me, it's like, think about it, you know? Like, how do we, how do we uh, be more conscious of our, of our usage, of our, the way we use the world? And it also just allows you to, you know, to take what's there and make it into something worth something rather than um, always consuming, always, always getting the better and the brighter and the faster and the easiest. And, you know, I'm a consumer too. I like, you know, grew up with not a lot, so I really like having nice things. <laughs> but I figure, you know, it's not going to last forever because our planet is going to get pretty pissed off at us if she isn't already. You know? So, does that answer your question? <laughs> wow. Amazing. Yeah, she's amazing. But she's like, but she's been, uh, <clears throat> I guess she looks like around 35, would you say 36, 30s? But she's been uh, successful from her 20s. But she is so conscious and so articulate and um, pretty incredible. She drives around on a Harley, too. <laughs> so, her, so. But uh, yeah, but uh, I when I listened to her, I thought there is uh, the main thing about her. Oh, I love her. I love her sculpture. If you go on, uh, well, right, fine, but if you go on uh, uh, <clears throat> Google Images, there's a nice collection of work, and, and there's other videos. Um, there's a um, or she's doing a presentation once. It's 35 minutes of slideshows talking about her development, her life. That's on there on YouTube, which is really good. Listen to her talk about her development as a person, as an artist, and her life history going to, going to art school and everything. And uh, it's called taking risks, uh, risk taking. Uh, but um, seeing, I just, the, what she's articulating is green consciousness and then tier two, the turquoise and yellow and turquoise to me, like that, uh, the sustainability, it's all green, it's green, but also the inner, the, um, the connected that valuing every object becomes sacred. You know, every object is alive and you can repurpose it. You know, even a car, it doesn't matter, even a car. It's, it's, um, cars are not beautiful. You know, that would be like a green thing. Ah, oh, cars, you know, they're polluters. Well, look what she did. She created a work of art. Uh, she created that whole car. <laughs> and it's, it's an evolving piece, you know, it just keeps going. Um, and this drawing on her uh, Native American traditions and just carrying them forward in, in a really powerful way. Uh, so. Yeah, new humanity for sure. I want to meet her. Actually, I got to don't tell her. I had a crush on her. I think she's just so cool. <laughs> you should. She's a good one to have a crush on. Yeah, I do. I got, I, uh, <laughs> don't send her an email and say my, my art teacher has a crush on. Don't do that. <laughs> no, I won't. I won't do that. It's up to you. <laughs> so, yeah. I'd love to meet her myself. Wouldn't it be phenomenal? Yeah. To go have an in-person Zoom meeting with her. In-person oh. meeting, physical, not mm -hmm. virtual, but real. It would be incredible to go out. I mean, she's a phenomenal human being. Phenomenal. Yeah. Here, this one's only one minute long. So here you go. This is cool. I'll watch this. <clears throat> a minute. This is part metal sculpture studio and part auto mechanic shop. Yeah. Yeah? It's the, this is my shop. Yeah. They have the studio. This is the shop. Yeah. And this is where Maria, the car, yeah, often where, sat. This is where she she took up a lot of space because she's she's a queen. 
and I also worked on her a lot in here. This is my happy place, it really is. It's always like a work in progress, as is everything, I guess, with cars. You know, when people say, is Maria done? Like, no. You know, you can mm. always fix it up more and more and better and better, yeah. right? Yeah. And then there's also, like, the engine I blew. I blew uh, Maria's original engine driving to Tucson with her. And, you know, I've been taking it apart in the transmission and using her in all my art pieces, like using all those car parts. Mm. And it's just, you know, pieces of Maria are like getting out into the world and all these ceramic sculptures. And, you know, I can build my, you know, parts for my sculptures and think bigger and bigger as I get better at working with steel and mixed media. <laughs> Yeah. There you go. The, um, <clears throat> if you're interested in more of that, that um, presentation she does, uh, it's called Taking Risks. It's, for, it's about 35 minutes long. It's really worth listening to, listening to her talk about her development. It's on YouTube. So just type in Rose Simpson, you'll see it. Uh, I recommend it. I was hoping to show up today, but you know. Uh, yeah, so okay. What was the name of the video that you showed and is it all the one that the longer one that you just showed and, and is it on YouTube? The, the younger the longer one. They're all on YouTube. Every one I got it. The right the, there's when you just do Rose Simpson, you'll see them all line up on the right there. What was the one you showed just before this shorter one? Uh the one where she showed the development of Maria. And uh, oh, the one where she's working on the basket? Yes. Uh What's the name of that one? Yes, what? the one you just showed. Yeah. Oh, the one I just showed, that short one, the one minute one? No, 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 the one just before that's about 10 oh, minutes long. That, that's called, uh, uh, do, 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 uh, well, LIT, the work of Rose B. Simpson. The work of Rose B. Simpson. I was right, nine minutes, 12 yeah. seconds, okay. But the other one is, uh, the longer one that's really worth seeing um, is, where is it here? I want to email that to several people I know in the environmental movement. Um, okay, the one that I really recommend, it's 45 minutes long. It's Rose Simpson, Simpson, The Ultimate Risk, Being True to Yourself. And it's a presentation she gave to a group of people at an art museum with a slideshow for work and her own development. It's really good, really, really good. So Rose Simpson, The Ultimate Risk, Being True to Yourself. Thank you.